welcome to a new episode of Gotham Outsiders, our Batman book club. Breaking out of Arkham just to watch myself on the big screen, I'm your host, Chris, a Batman obsessive. And with me, trying to take a selfie with Batman, is my co-host, TJ. Hi, everyone. I am your Chris-proclaimed Batman acolyte. But we have a lot of tools in our utility belt, and one of the things we're pulling out today is a new guest, Jeremy Whitley, the writer of Unstoppable Wasp, Princeless, and the upcoming Marvel action Chillers. Hello, Jeremy. Hey, I like to think of myself as the shark repellent spray of this particular belt. <laughs> that, that is what you are. You've kept Very all the important. sharks away from me so far. <laughs> it's it's the it's the most important tool especially if you know you're the adam west batman yes <laughs> yes so how do you two know one another uh i know chris because uh we i think met through sort of indirectly through ben uh ben con online and uh it just so happened that at the time that we that i i became aware of chris i was writing uh, an arc in Unstoppable Wasp that had to do uh, specifically with uh, Nadia, the wasp, discovering that she was uh, bipolar and uh, suffering a, a manic episode. And I thought, hey, here is somebody who knows about psychology and uh, and comic books and seems like they would be excited to talk about this. Let me like ask Chris if, if she'd be into, you know, reading this over and, and giving me some notes. And she was very much excited about that and so never uh, stopped up, being excited about it <laughs> yeah so it ended up making uh uh making a much better i think uh comic out of those couple issues and then uh, even getting even getting profiled in one of them so we Aww. could talk about suicide prevention and stuff so yeah that was honestly one of the most fun things i've ever done with my psych degree <laughs> yeah we've established on this podcast that i'm a marvel boy so if no one has read Jeremy's Unstoppable Wasp run over at Marvel, you should totally go check it out. It is so good. It is so good. Thank you. Yeah, she, she's uh, she's she's my baby. <laughs> you know, she was uh, it was a super cool opportunity to write that, that book because she had only just started appearing in Avengers, and um, you know I had been sort of begging to do something larger than the uh, one issue thing over at Marvel and they were like hey you know we think you'd be a good fit for this story and so uh you know several years later it's been sort of weirdly defining all of like 20 issues of, of stuff I've written about her absolutely and of, of particular interest to our audience there's a lot of queer representation in your story and it's honestly so well done yeah very much so and I I, I mean I try to have some of that in as, as many of my stories as possible. Um, it's not always possible in, in licensed and uh, company owned things, but um, you know, Marvel has been uh, pretty good about uh, yeah. letting me at least create characters who are queer, even if uh, they're not quite as excited about making canonical uh, long running characters uh, less than straight. <laughs> Yes, uh, and we're well aware of how other comics are maybe mm, less interested in doing that as we are on a Batman podcast. <laughs> Chris, I think my bat senses are tingling. Do you have some trivia questions? I have some trivia questions. Okay, uh, I am prepared. I think I've got this one. Jeremy, how's your Batman knowledge? Um... <laughs> uh... Is it about the giant penny? Because oh, I'm gonna have to cross one out. You know that one already. <laughs> I don't know what that is, so let's take that one out. Oh, ma- putting it right back in because TJ doesn't know. <laughs> no, so so far, TJ, what's your score with this game? <laughs> I have won once with a tie, which I'm counting as a win, <laughs> uh, which was our last episode. But besides that, I have yet to actually win a round. Or, uh, One time you lost to someone who knew nothing about Batman, which was maybe the funniest. <laughs> it's rigged, Chris. Chris does it on purpose. I have you know that there are three questions today and only one of them is obviously rigged. Come on. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be talking about Batgirl. So my first question is, how many different Batgirls can you name? I'll go first. Okay. 
I'm going to start with Cassandra Kane. I'm really glad you got that one right. Barbara yeah, Gordon. This is the name that tune kind of thing. Okay. Barbara Gordon. Uh huh. Uh, now, if I say one that isn't correct, am I done or can I keep going? Wait, are you just going to start guessing? Well, I was, <laughs> I was going to, oh, you know what? Um, I'm remembering a third one. Her name is Carrie from The Dark Knight Returns. I think. I thought she was a Robin. She is a Robin. Oh, that is a Robin. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking Batgirls. I was like, I know I haven't read a lot of Frank Miller, but I could have sworn uh, she was a Robin. <laughs> gosh, Chris, stop embarrassing me in front of Jeremy Whitley. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, like sidebar here, but TJ, I, you're I'm embarrassing doing it myself. you. <laughs> um, was Stephanie Brown? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're so proud. So now I'm at three. Yeah, Jeremy, do you know any that TJ has forgotten? Uh, let's see. So those those are the three main ones. Yeah, um, I'm very impressed. I was not expecting him to get to three. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Let's see. I'm trying to think if. I'm sure, I'm sure there's been like a part-time Batgirl at some point that I'm not thinking of, uh, but there is also, um, uh, what's her name, Cassandra McGinnis? Yeah. Yeah, Terry's daughter. I feel like Jeremy would have named the three I named anyway, so if he gets a fourth yeah. one, I think he wins. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I was very impressed you got Stephanie Brown. I didn't know you knew she was Batgirl. Oh, thanks. It was a good guess. <laughs> oh, I knew it was a guess! Uh, I was wondering if you were paying attention when I was talking last week and said that. Yeah, I might have been subconscious. She's had as many different titles as uh, as Tim at this point, so. Yes, this is true. Because She's been Robin and Batgirl and spoiler and yeah. probably something else at some point during the new 52. Probably. <laughs> they everybody's name for no good reason then. <laughs> probably those are the three that are mainly her what is lady shiva's deal oh i might know this uh-huh so she popped up in this book and you know this. i had absolutely no idea who she was <laughs> so i googled her DJ. <laughs> and i did not know this was a question oh, she, so i don't know if this is the answer you're looking for but she's a i know she's cassandra kane's mother Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, and she's like an assassin and she has no powers. So I'm kind of confused as to how she trained uh, Cass <laughs> to have her skills back so quickly. Because I was thinking like, oh, maybe she can transfer skills or knowledge, but apparently not. So that that's the extent of my knowledge on her as a character. Now, Jeremy, to steal the point, do you know more things about Lady Shiva than that? <laughs> Her name is Sandra Wusan, and she is the greatest assassin who has ever lived. She is uh, better than Batman. Mm -hmm. She she holds the odd distinction in Batman of being the person who's definitely better than Batman. Yes, and, um, and the weird distinction of having trained multiple of his kids. <laughs> yeah, and at some point, I think she was a canary as well. Um, but I, I don't remember <laughs> what story that was from. Um, but yeah, she's uh, she's been in the Birds of Prey before and she's, uh, I mean, she's the greatest. Um, and yeah, she's probably Cassandra's mother. There's like, it, I feel like in this run at some point it goes from being like, uh, yeah, we think probably she's Cassandra's mother to like, oh yeah, she's Cassandra's mother without anybody ever actually like proving it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I think you're right. So TJ, um, who who do you think got that point? <laughs> Why are you making me decide? I'm biased. <laughs> because, oh really? You think you won? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have ulterior motives here. I was just, you have accused me of rigging it. Who do you think won that? <laughs> I guess we can give it to Jeremy. Okay. He's the guest. We have to be polite. Oh, I see. Well, okay. Now we're going to hit the actually rigged question. <laughs> uh -oh. oh, gosh. Jeremy, uh, because this relates to a past episode where we got it wrong, and I know for a fact you have corrected us on this, what is Catwoman's cultural heritage? 
So Catwoman's uh, father is Irish and her mother is Cuban. And my answer, if Jeremy had not told <laughs> us, I would have said, well, she's white besides in Gotham High where she is Latinx. So I think I would have lost that one. You, you would have, yes. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a piece of information that uh, nine-tenths of the comics internet does not know and one-tenth will not stop telling you. <laughs> <laughs> which That's which right. is why when I heard when I heard the episode I was like hey yes um, it was a chance to educate I had never I've read a lot of Catwoman and had never run across that fact so I don't think it comes up until like the Brubaker run of Catwoman yeah um so I, did, I think it's the Brubaker cook stuff um there are some flashbacks to her as a child and uh they they talk briefly about her mother being Cuban and then you see her mother and her father fighting and uh, I believe her mother and speaks this, Spanish and in points in there as well. This seems to be a fact that most of the current writers have forgotten. It seems to be a fact that's forgotten like constantly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was wondering, I'm like, am I missing this or was it never come up again because... And Jeremy, you said you've actually written a comic where Catwoman speaks Spanish. Uh, yeah, so I, I got invited to be part of a uh, anthology a while back. It's actually the only thing I've ever written with DC characters uh, officially, but it was after uh, the hurricane hit Puerto Rico and uh, there were several anthologies raising money. Um, there is a, uh, a anthology, it's still out there. It's called Reconstruction. Um, Recon as in Puerto Rican instruction. Um, and it features a lot of uh, short, like, you know, two, three page stories with uh, this uh, character that's uh, a creator owned character, La Burquena, who just basically wears a big Puerto Rican flag as a costume, um, who is a, a Puerto Rican superhero who is, uh, you know, fighting along all these, alongside all these DC characters or uh, they're helping in, in some way with the uh, the devastation in Puerto Rico. Um, and I ended up uh, writing a story. I had wanted to do a um, Gotham City Sirens story with, you know, Catwoman, Harley, and Ivy. Uh, and it turned out Harley was otherwise occupied in this uh, anthology. So uh, it ended up that I, I can only use Catwoman and Ivy, which was cool because I only had three pages. Um, <laughs> So I, I bring up the fact in that that, that Catwoman has uh, has family in Cuba, and while she is in Puerto Rico, at a couple of points she speaks Spanish to you know little girls there, and it's, it's both her and Ivy are excitedly helping the, uh, the island get ready for Three Kings Day. That sounds so wholesome. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I've told you I'm going out of my way to buy a copy off Amazon, so I'm gonna read it and I'll get back to you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to write. And my my frequent collaborators, uh, Rose Stein and Ted Brandt, who did a bunch of the uh, um, Raven Pirate Princess stuff with me and also work on Crowded now over at Image, uh, did the illustrations for that. And they, it's, it's amazing. It's sort of a Bruce Tim style look to it. So it's very much like the animated series. I love that. Awesome. Well, I have a bonus question that technically no one can win because there's no right answer. Uh, so you can just enjoy it. Based on the story today, I pose you the question, would you rather live one perfect year or an imperfect lifetime? Imperfect lifetime, because that's more time. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with, uh, with the imperfect lifetime as well, because I feel like you can... You can stumble doing stumble into doing more good and important in a in an imperfect lifetime than you can manage to pack into one year. Are we suggesting that Cassandra may have made a bad choice? <laughs> I mean, I feel like it was a choice that felt reasonable for this book and this character at the time. It, it, you know, it felt true to her. So, yeah. Fair enough. Well, Jeremy, you have soundly beat TJ, and it was only a <laughs> little bit rigged. <laughs> Today we are doing Batgirl Volume 1, Silent Night by Kelly Puckett. And now it is time to get into the meat of the story. So I'm going to start with 
I thought Cass was a newer character to the Batman canon. I didn't realize she had been around since like the early 2000s. I thought she came around like 2015. Yeah, she's been she's been around. Um, I want to say her first appearance is, is back during No Man's Land. I don't know if that's right or not, but she's she's introduced sort of peripherally as a bad guy, and then uh, you know turns over the course of the story and is then uh, in in her own series as Batgirl in this. Yeah. I think one of the confusing factors for people is that every time they reboot it, she's new again. <laughs> so <laughs> unlike some of the characters that they'll reboot when they have like a history, she's always like reintroduced. Apparently Kelly Puckett, and I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, he created Cass, the character, and I kind of Googled around to uh, see what he's up to. I couldn't find him anywhere. So Kelly, we hope you're doing okay. Yeah, I, I feel like Kelly Puckett was really sort of proficient during the time these these issues were originally coming out, and uh, which you know was very early two thousands, um, and I, I don't know what he's up to right now. Yeah. Um, Apparently, this was the very first Batgirl ongoing series, which is wild because like Barbara Gordon has been around since, I mean, Forever. since before, yeah, since before the. Uh, the original 60s TV show, obviously, because she's in yeah. that and she already existed at that point. Yeah, it is wild. Uh, there's been like so many since then that I would think that I would have thought there were more before that, but that is, it is wild that this is the first. I really wish we had gotten more of Barbara in this book. I wanted yeah. like, like the Batman cast relationship was really strong in this, but I wanted it to be equally as strong with Barbara. Yeah, I agree. I liked, I loved what there is of it, definitely. But yeah, there could have been more, which means, TJ, you should definitely read Shadow of the Batgirl because it's all about the two of them. Oh. Yeah, I love the, like, late 90s, early 2000s Bat family setup where, like, everybody knows each other and, like, they work together occasionally and they have, you know, some amount of relationships that, you know, bounce around where... I think over the course of this book, uh, Stephanie Brown doesn't appear in the uh, issues we're talking about today because we only read the first 12, mm -hmm. but I think she's in the later part of this and then she has a you know run as Batgirl afterwards. Yeah. So like this book actually has all three like m current continuity Batgirls in it at some point. Yeah, that's true. And it has a brief cameo of my favorite Robin, Tim. <laughs> He has a very brief cameo in this one. He, I, I feel like, is in like three I pages. Think, <laughs> yeah, later in the run, there is a crossover with the Robin book in which he was like Robin as an ongoing series at that point. Yeah. Jeremy, on this podcast, we take a shot every time Chris says Tim. <laughs> you would be dead, TJ. You would be dead. <laughs> Every time he's mentioned, even in books he's not in, I make sure to bring it up. <laughs> she does. But I also love Tim now as of our last episode, so it's fine. Yeah, I've, I've uh, won him over. Yeah, and speaking of last episode, I made the point that Cass reminded me of X-23 from X-Men Marvel, uh, and that I still felt that way here, but I, it seems like they were created right around the same time. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's very close to the same time. They have a very similar sort of theme of like, and it comes up a lot in the early issues of, of this run of like, she's a lot like me. She, she's the, you know, girl Batman, um, as opposed yeah. to, you know, the, the other, the other two Batgirls are nothing like Bruce. Um, yeah, and so there's a he definitely new, relates to her. Yeah. There's a new push. I don't know if you've seen it, Jeremy, but the Bat fandom is very much pushing for, um, cast to become Batman at some point, uh, to take on the mantle. And I see it reading this one. I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, they said she was like just as good as Batman, if not better at her best. So like, and like he was training her so closely here. And, and I mean, he trains every Robin, I guess. But the fact that she is, I don't know, this version of Batgirl just felt very close to home for Bruce Wayne. So I think that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. I feel like each of the Robins relate to a part of him to some degree more or less 
but uh she does feel the closest honestly yeah i think like the there's several stories in the 12 issues we're, we're talking about today but my favorite story in it is a very batman story which is the lady shiva story uh yes. which you made reference to before about you know her like she's she's having issues with her abilities so she tracks down lady shiva and like challenges to her to a fight knowing she's going to get her ass kicked <laughs> yeah, yeah so just the on the off chance that she'll agree to train her she's just like all right let me just go fight shiva and either i'll die or she'll help me out here <laughs> the, like the first couple issues there's a black man that she runs into and she tries to save him robinson uh, J- yeah robinson. i think that was his name and he just dies it was it was very impactful for the short amount of time that they have this character right that was such a that was such a emotional arc and it happened so quickly it's 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 so interesting because it feels like we kind of jump in mid story with the the first issue because it's kind of jumping out of you know the appearances she's made barbara's already training her uh there's no like big introduction to to Cass, but uh yeah, we get that that sort of first story, which is a little bit of like, here's who this is, a little bit of background and flashback stuff on her. And then, yeah, that second story is about the guy who stands up to uh, like a mafia boss's son. And then like she she rescues him in the street and then they go ahead and kidnap him anyway, yeah. uh, just to, you know, prove a point. And she has to help track him down. Uh, and as TJ pointed out, she fails to save him fails to save him being the exact phrase that Bruce uses and Barbara fusses at him for, uh, which leads to my favorite Bruce moment of like just being a terribly facepalm of a dad where he he tells her, it doesn't matter if it's impossible, you have to do it. (laughs) I think it's that scene too where Barbara stands up to him and I was like, damn girl, you go. And like makes me wish she had been in this more. Every time she talks to him, she's like, stop it. And his whole argument in this scene is he's like, she's like me. I know how to raise her. And my notes ju- here just say, but you didn't even raise you well. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's a real like mom mom and dad are fighting moment <laughs> in this. <laughs> yes. Where like she, uh, Barbara has such a like, she's trying to, to preserve Cass and to, you know, trying to take this girl who's been raised to be an assassin and has not had a normal life yeah. and give her some semblance of normal life along with this vigilante stuff, which she seems determined to do more so than I think any of the Robins, except maybe Tim, like she seems yeah. determined to be part of this. Um, and like yeah, Barbara is, is trying to you know, save her from, I mean, equal parts sort of herself and Bruce and Bruce is like, no, I, I know how this should go down. You know, she's she's like me. This is like me. Um, she's, I, I almost get the impression in this like conversation that he's he's not so much pushing his idea here as like being like, well, being like me, this is how she will feel. And this is, you know, what she needs to hear. In the last episode, I talked about uh, the voices we have for the characters in our heads. And we, of course, we talked about Kevin Conroy as Batman. Uh, we debated Ruby Rose as Batwoman while reading uh, while reading this one with Cass. I, I know she wouldn't play the character in live action, of course, but Summer Glau, uh, I, I, I don't know, she just has like that oddness. Does anyone else have like a certain voice for her character? Because she's so distinct. And it's interesting, it's like having a voice for Cass is an interesting thought because she is mostly nonverbal. So I I don't know that I had a voice for the words she does use. You mean she used to be mostly nonverbal? She's still mostly nonverbal even after. Okay, I mean- We'll get into this. I have lots of notes about this uh, part of it. Me uh, too. Like her internal dialogue, I guess then, is what we're talking about. But that doesn't even- She doesn't have internal dialogue until issue what- yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. I feel like I don't have a voice for her because she is such a physical character. I would have to imagine a casting for her and I don't know who I would pick. Do you have anyone in mind, Jeremy? Um, not really. I think Summer Glau is, is similar in that sort of 
um, physical weirdness way that <laughs> that you kind of would need to be to play Cass. Um, you know, you need somebody who is uh, a little lanky, a little weird looking um, that can believably be, you know, this sort of hardened hardened killer, but also this sort of weird lost kid that she is too. And talking about her physicality, I think we have to talk about the art because I thought while the art is super early 2000s for better or worse, I I thought it did a great job in those first three or four issues when she wasn't speaking at all. Like it conveyed so much of her character through the art. I agree. There there is a panel even, so she doesn't she isn't speaking yet and she's wearing the mask that covers her whole face that has like the mouth part stitched up which is my favorite costume for Cass. i love this costume so much um and there's a moment when she's still expressive with her body where you see shock on both her like in her eyes and her body and the art is so brilliant at conveying this and like the fight scenes with no no quippy dialogue no internal monologues like just her fighting these guys like it was so fluid i loved it absolutely i feel like i always knew where her head was at even though as you you know jeremy is pointing out there wasn't this internal monologue but i still knew what was going on with her yeah i think throughout most of this uh these 12 issues because there's a few guest writer and guest artist issues towards the end throughout most of it though it has this uh, people say cartoony in a way that they they mean it in a degrading way, but that's um, I would say cartoony in a good way here because it's yeah. you know people stretch and move and uh, you know they convey so much about what's going on through you know sort of this fluid movement. It's uh, Damien Scott that's drawing all of this stuff, yeah. and like it. It does so much with, um, you know, with the the fighting, and with the movement, and I think, you know, it, it also does a lot with the the Batgirl costume. Uh, it yes. moves in the way that like Spider Man costumes frequently move, which is like, you know, the eyes expand and contract to to show emotion and things like that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of like subtle cues to what's going on internally for her like there's one panel i really love where she sees her shadow and her shadow looks like batman and it kind of like stops her for a minute Mm -hmm. there's all these like subtle see we don't have to hear from her to know what's going on in her head and the art is what does that there's a part where i don't even remember the context but batman is talking about using the computer or the internet and he refers to it as the net (laughs) And I lost it. (laughs) There's definitely a few moments. I mean, wait till we get to the annual where we're like, ah, I know what time this was written. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to put the annual in a little box and talk about that at the end. So finally, Cass gets the ability to comprehend language and can speak to a degree. How did you guys feel about that? I have about a page of notes about it as I like went through it. So I am, I teach psychology, but I'm not a developmental psychologist. So this is not my area of expertise. That said, it's not their area of expertise either. (laughs) (laughs) I, I have written in all caps, she was not raised nonverbal. They say this over and over again, but this is possible to do. And we've had actual cases of it where literally people were raised by animals, right? Like people were found in the wild. This was a thing that has happened. That is being raised nonverbal. He still communicates, he being uh, Kane. He's a very like 90s Batman bad guy. He's one of the many one of the many unstoppable mercenaries Batman fought in the 90s. So many of them. And he refers to another one. He refers to Wilson in this one. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's. I guess at some point he was partners with Slade. Yeah. Um, which, like, one of those guys is still around. <laughs> one of them <laughs> is. I mean, Kane popped up again in Eternal, so I guess he is still around sometimes when it's useful. David Kane communicates with her verbally. He tells her what to do, which means he did not raise her nonverbal. She would have still had the ability to understand language more than they said she did. So that's just your psych nerd fact of the day. 
Um, and so, so there's a lot there with like the way her brain compre- has like rewired to comprehend physicality as language does not make any sense, but um, yeah, fine, we'll accept it. Lot, it reminds <laughs> me a lot of every time that somebody decides they want to do something fun with Cypher's powers in X-Men, yeah. where they're like, yeah, he just reads like movement as language. Like, you know, it's it's a language, so he understands it because he understands all the languages. So he knows exactly what they're thinking and what they're doing. It's like, mm, right? It that's would, a stretch. It, it plays so fast and loose with how much she should be able to understand based on that too, especially before she gets, you know, we'll get to the changing of her language abilities. But before that, she seems to understand every word they're saying. And then it keeps saying that she doesn't. But, and then they're like, oh, it's because she reads body language. I do not care how well you read body language. The things they are saying to her should be incomprehensible if that's all she's reading. Yeah, yeah. like, she never seems to have any trouble understanding Barbara, even though she can't talk to Barbara. Right. And then in issue three, it's like, they're already planning to introduce the concept of, of giving her, you know, understanding and language. So suddenly... Uh, Batman gives a whole long speech to her about how she has to be perfect and all this stuff. And then he's like, you don't understand anything I'm saying, do you? And she's just like, nope. Yeah, but see, even that scene, though, reading it and she flashes back to it later when she realizes she's failing. And I'm like, so she did, though. (laughs) To be clear, (laughs) she did. She lied. She said she didn't, but she did. She's got a lot of it from like his facial features and emotions like, he, like i could just she tell knew. you're disappointed through the mask i could see yeah. it <laughs> jeremy side note that was a great batman impersonation <laughs> was good. thank you christopher <laughs> morse who we had on last episode did a great joker laugh uh so together we could have you do a whole episode <laughs> my batman is really more of a diedrich bader brave and the bold batman i like it we'll take yeah, it i i can't do i can't make him sound like Batman the Animated Series. And I can do Christian Bale, but I hate that voice. (laughs) We don't want you to lose your voice before the end of the podcast by making you do Christian Bale's Batman. Yeah, it's one of my great aspirations to be able to do a believable Mark Hamill Joker because that's one of the greatest, like, voice... That's one of the greatest voices of all time. So back to the (laughs) cast getting to be able to speak and understand language. Do you guys think... Did this guy have the right to do what he did to her? That w- that that whole story is so wild. I mean, I'm glad they acknowledge when he's like, I'm so sorry I didn't ask you, but you literally couldn't have understood, which again doesn't make right. sense based on everything else we've seen. Uh, <laughs> but I'm glad they acknowledged it, but it oh wow, it was wild. The psychic uh psychic ethics are something to be discussed. <laughs> It's very, I have a device, <laughs> and this is what it does kind of thing. Right. You know, she, just, she just saves this kid who is psychic and can rewire her brain by touching her so that she not only understands thought, but now has an internal monologue. Um, like, she literally develops an internal monologue in the middle of the page. Um, yeah. And is like, what's that? Who's talking? In my head. Um, yeah. It's wild. This might be an unpopular opinion, but after a couple issues of her having internal dialogue, I was like, you know what? I kind of would have preferred if she didn't have it. No, I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. I would have. So okay, good. The, the way language actually works in the world, she could have acquired it. She could have learned. Um, you know, it's sort of a myth that if you don't learn it by a certain age, you won't ever learn it. Uh, so she could have, and it would have been more interesting, and I think maybe better representation of special needs if she'd yeah gotten it as you know she'd worked speech therapy wise instead well, like, of just magically having it. Taking this shortcut kind of undermines the emotional beat of her starting to learn language yeah. because of the the man that died that she failed to save. This is very much a, uh, we don't know how to write the, you know what? Magic. Magic is how. Yeah, he was a plot device, but. It's like, I'm, I'm of several minds about this because. Please tell us all your minds. <laughs> I, I just like stumbled upon this thing 
coincidentally today, uh, where there's this long discussion on the internet going on about um, women and particularly women of color and even more specifically Asian women in media and especially in film who just don't talk. Like oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, they don't talk, they don't communicate with the people around them, they don't, they're basically nonverbal. Uh, and they were talking a lot about the uh, the character from The Boys, who I think has a name in the TV show, but did not in the, the comics. She was just the female who is, you know, completely nonverbal um, throughout yeah. the entire story. And there's a character in Pitch Perfect that's basically the same yep. thing. Yeah, she was she was another one that they brought up. But there's there's just all these examples of, of especially, you know, Asian women who uh, either, you know, it's trauma or it's spookiness they're you know just they're weird spooky characters or they don't speak english or whatever but you know they um they just don't talk um yeah and that's like that is a problem um yeah and but also you know there is something to be done with you know the the development of this character and developing through this uh inability to speak and you know being raised not to speak yeah. and you, you could do something interesting with that and also <laughs> also in a, on another hand on the third hand now <laughs> um like those the issues where she doesn't talk much are really interesting you were talking about how yeah. fast this book reads um i like that i i think it's really well done yeah. and that you get everything you need to get from facial expression and movement and things like that in a way that is only possible in a comic. Yeah, um, so in in the fandom, I'm going to bring in fan fiction now. <laughs> the way that Cass is generally written, and I love this, and I'm not actually sure if this has ever popped up in any comics. I'm, I don't think it has. I, the, I, at this point, it's so in the fandom that I forget it's not canon. <laughs> But she she speaks in sign language, like she learns to speak sign language. And it's really lovely. Like it makes sense with her understanding physicality that she'd be able to learn sign language more easily. And that is also pretty common with people who have selective mutism or or you know, sometimes it's autism or different things that prevent speech, is that mm -hmm. they'll be able to learn sign language more easily. And so the way the fans have taken this is to make this this beautiful representation. And I always forget and until I get into one of her comics that it's made up. So I think you both make great points. And it, I, it makes me rephrase my opinion to be, I wish they had built up more like naturally to her developing yes. the internal dialogue instead of just all of a sudden, oh, it was magic. I, yes. I would have loved if from the drop, she had had internal monologue. And yeah. she, like, she knew what she was thinking. Because the idea of her not having thoughts in her head and like a, you know, yeah. even if they're not sort of, even if she doesn't hear her voice necessarily, she's still thinking. Yeah. And this and weird bit of like, you know, mysticism of her like being raised to, you know, right. communicate through fighting instead of um, right. instead of, uh, talking is, it, it's nonsense. Um, yeah. But it would be entirely possible that you know she she didn't talk had selective mutism or um you know right. had never been taught how to talk um or even you know, if she's just not been allowed which honestly yeah. reading the way that they describe how uh kane raised her it's like he read a psych 101 textbook <laughs> I was just like, he knows nothing. And uh, Batman's like, he's so smart. I'm like, is he? Um, but <laughs> the the way that he raised her to not talk seemed to be mostly punishing talking, in which case it would make sense for her to have selective mutism. It would not make sense for her to not, to not have verbal thought. That's the part that makes no sense. I just, I, yeah. I wasn't a fan of how her internal dialogue was written a lot of the time. Like, yeah. One of the first pages where she actually gets the quote ability to do it she says in her head to a villain are you high like it was I, I, a very early 2000s i was like, gonna say that's the that's the year that is not right that. but i was just like really we're gonna write her like this like i don't know i wanted her to feel more unique just yeah. because the book felt so unique when we were just relying on the physicality yeah, yeah i feel like those those first 
three issues. It has just the physicality and it kind of works, but it feels like inevitable that they're going to change that. And I, I do think yeah. there should have been, you know, some some amount of internal monologue or dialogue in there. Yeah. And then like four and five, they throw that in and it it just goes way too far almost right. immediately. And it, it's got slang and yeah, there, there's a way I was I was just like, did the psychic just give her his form of talking? Like I, I was very confused with what was supposed to have happened. Yeah, I, I feel like once we get to the Shiva story in seven yes. and eight, it like finds the balance. I agree. Which is like she's she's thinking, but what you're he, what you're seeing mostly from her internal monologue is like the things that she notices because of how she's been raised to fight. Like, you know, she sees the way that Shiva walks. She sees what she was doing. She is constantly aware of these things around her with yeah. in like a, a way that makes a lot of sense. Whereas this, none of this makes any sense. No, no, it's, it's a big old mess. And there, I mean, there is some discussion to be had, like people have different ways that their internal dialogue happens you know, not everybody is very auditory. So there could have been some of that. She could have been more visual, but the way that it was like, she has no thoughts. Now she has thoughts was- There just... is a literal two page splash that is like Kung Fu stances. Right. Slowly talk. turning into the word talk. I was and... so confused on what was happening in that Me scene. I, I mean, I got it later, but at that moment I was like, who is this? Can we talk about Batman doing the I can't hear you Okay, so we can, up. <laughs> we can talk about Tim. <laughs> yes, this is the Tim part. I, I'm so ready. Okay, so Tim comes in for no other reason than Batman doesn't want to argue with Oracle again, which <laughs> cracks me up. So he's already avoiding one of his family members, and he's like, Tim, do this for me. And then Tim's like, why didn't you ask Oracle? And Batman straight up does the, you're breaking up. There is no way Tim Drake, actual best detective in the world, did not know that was fake. Yeah, I feel like he's the code to be like, you're doing that on purpose. Stop I it. Know. There's definitely a like a scene that happens off panel. It's just Tim rolling his eyes like, I can't believe you're doing this again, dad. <laughs> I also want to mention in this scene, why does Bruce's private jet have so many seats? <laughs> like... It's when he Who needs else to, is taking this private jet with when him? he needs to take all the kids out. Uh, yeah, like, that's the whole family jet, just in case. <laughs> just in case. Yeah, of course he's he's got you know his seat, and I guess the one next to him is for Alfred, and then everybody else has to sit facing the other direction behind him. Um, <laughs> that feels so right. He's like, don't look at me. He's and just right got on, random like files and uh, Gotham magazine on his table. His jet looked so silly. I, I definitely laughed at it. Right around this yeah. time is when we get the, the cellulite joke, and it's like, haha, Barbara's in a wheelchair. She's fat now. Oh, yeah. What on earth? What? Why Why was that a word? First of all, because so this is the scene where Barbara's like, you know the word for this? How about this? Why is cellulite the thing she says? Why would that ever be the thing? And uh, then, yeah, I have no idea. Oh, there's a, yeah, there's a lot happening there. It's, Let me get it's a very men writing women moment <laughs> yeah and then we get to shiva who i had never heard of before now i cannot believe you haven't heard of shiva that is so surprising to me i feel like she's in everything her name sounds familiar but i could not place her whatsoever they've even made a version of her in the dc superhero girls like somehow they've made her child friendly <laughs> <laughs> How'd you guys like when Shiva beats up Cass, she leaves like her pearl wristband? In a like puddle of blood? I yeah, and like, I'm like, what? it was like what? an homage to his parents getting killed but or something. But why? Were we supposed to briefly think she was dead in the middle of an issue? <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was funny though. I thought it was funny too, but I just don't know why it happened. I think before the Shiva story, the like the one, I... I don't care much about issue six because it's all about villains being bad at villaining um except like Cass is as a result of getting speech has lost some of her fighting ability and yes. like she's i i think the most incredible scene for her in this is that like there is a guy trying to snipe the person she is protecting so she straight yes. up runs at him and takes all of the bullets like 
she just lets herself get shot several times to yes. to save this person. This is this is such a good cast moment. This is a terrible Bruce as a dad moment though, because he's like, I'm so proud. And then yeah. Barbara's <laughs> like, No, no, we don't encourage this. I'm so proud you let yourself get shot several times rather he's than like, let some stranger die. Just like I would. <laughs> There's a really badass scene when Batman goes to confront Kane. Um, he's like, I didn't come here to arrest you. I came here to make you wish I had. Is the word badass or just terrible decision making? <laughs> I, I thought it was a good line. I was like, oh, you get in bats. It's a good line, but my note here is, so his not killing people is a technicality. Like, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of writers that try to push this, like, Batman won't kill people, but I mean, he'll basically kill people. He will push them right up to the edge and hope they don't die of internal injuries. In his defense, Kane was fine. Yeah, in his defense, apparently Kane has superhuman healing abilities we didn't know about. Yeah, right after the fight with him and Kane, he gets bruises, so I guess Kane got a few good swings in there, uh, and Cass also had her fight, so her and Bruce run into each other, and they both touch each other's bruises, like, oh, are you okay? And it's so cute. That is the best moment between the two of them. I think it was really cute. I, I think that whole story that goes along with, like, her, like, Batman's bit in this with Kane is... I don't know. <laughs> it's not very it's good. Baffling. So that yeah, we haven't really touched on this. He gets a mysterious message, which is funny that it's mysterious because he knows immediately who it's from. There's no detecting. He's just like, it's Kane. Um, and it says that she is a murderer, to which I wrote, but you knew she was an assassin. What what yeah, did it's you like think video she did? of her as a little girl like murdering a bunch of dudes? And it's like, yeah, man, that's yeah like that's an assassin. An assassin to be an assassin that's what she what, does i'm so like what did you think she was was she making it, cupcakes it, like it, what did you think it left off with him being like choosing to believe she hadn't done it right <laughs> yeah but the, yeah but but like because alfred says um it didn't look like she knew what was going to happen this is my favorite alfred moment by the way because bruce might be uh arguably the world's greatest detective that's actually tim but Alfred is the world's greatest parent because he's like, I, you might know detecting, I know children, and that's not the face of a murderer. <laughs> right. And to me, in that scene, it, and the way I interpreted it was that Alfred knew what Bruce wanted to hear. So he told him, like, oh, it was manipulated footage. And but on his face in the second panel, his expression changes. And to me, I was like, oh, obviously he's lying to make Bruce feel better. Oh, that's interesting. I could see it. I didn't I didn't read that into it, but I could see that being the case. And I mean it wasn't doctored, right? No. No. Okay. I would assume not. It doesn't make any sense for it to be doctored like no. she's, you know, uh, this is another like place where she's like X23 like she's created to kill people. Why would we not think that she had killed people? Right. Well, and then when he when he does get to talk to Kane later, there's all this other footage and Kane's like, do you think I went through and doctored all of these? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I don't know. That whole thing is absolutely baffling. Like why he was confused by that. He has this whole speech about how she holds back and that's why, you know, she's on his side. That's why he picked her because she is even better than him at not hurting people, which it turns out is not hard. We learn later. But um, mm -hmm. but he he you know, he makes this little speech. And he's like, if I knew she was capable of this, and I was like, what do you mean? You, I think you he did like no. <laughs> he was seeing so much of himself in her, and like wanted to think she could be better. Like I don't know. Like to me, it's kind of sweet that he didn't want to accept it, uh, and that's why I think like Alfred had this perspective yeah. of wanting to give him what he needed in that moment. I think the part that's just lost me in this scene was what did he think she did before? Right. I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like it's this bizarre sense of morality that like, okay, yes, she killed people as a child because that's what she was raised to do. That doesn't mean that like 
she's really into killing people. Like, you know, I I used to stock store shelves as a, you know, at a grocery store. I'm not really into <laughs> groceries. Like, right. that's not why I did that job. Right. right. And like, in that way, like, if you're using that perspective, like, that's saying that there's no redemption for the people that have made mistakes. Right. And she was a child. Like that's, I feel like more important than whether it was true or not. Alfred's statement of like, she didn't obviously on her face, she didn't know what she was doing is important. She was like five. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It was confusing. And then, then Batman's second realization, again, he is not the greatest detective in the world. He can't even like barely deduce anything in this story because his second thing that he learns from Kane is that Kane abused her. And I was like, surprise question mark. (laughs) You didn't realize this. (laughs) Yeah. I, I mean, literally everything about her childhood is abuse. Like he, he literally goes, I thought you were a genius, but it turns out you were just an abusive father. And I was like, yes, obviously. And so the Shiva arc where she comes to town and they fight and then she ends up giving Cass these skills back. Can someone explain to me what exactly happened there? Nope. Nope. <laughs> no. I have no idea. I, I love this. So this is the the part that I referenced during our trivia, <laughs> would you rather part, uh, where she gives her the option that she will trade her. Uh, and if she comes back in a year to fight, knowing that Shiva will probably win and kill her, um, or that she can just take longer. That was the alternative. <laughs> So, like, I was fully expecting there to be, like, a flashback to show what exactly happened between them, but we didn't get that. So, I'm wondering, (laughs) Jeremy, have you, you've read the whole run? Does that happen at any point? Uh, The flashback or the... uh, Like, explaining... the death. (laughs) Like, I guess both, like, explaining how she got her mojo back so quickly. I don't think it's explained. Um, I... (laughs) It's... I don't know. It's a very like, I I feel like it's intentionally vague in this where it's like, you know, you can't just, just like the, (laughs) the psychic guys uh, messing up her stuff in the first place, (laughs) the more they explain that the worse it got. Um, And I think this, they're like, uh, yeah, I mean, Shiva can train anybody to do anything. She's, she's that good. So they just did it, you know? (laughs) she's just the world's greatest teacher she's just so good it and she's like doing infomercials that are like in one lesson i can make you <laughs> she'd be she'd be a ted talk all-star if she didn't kill everybody that she taught you know? <laughs> yeah she does a ted talk and then she murders the whole audience <laughs> so i'm i'm frantically googling over here <laughs> and so supposedly i don't know i'm assuming this is in this story line that Shiva tells Cass that the secret is to not fear death, but I don't know if that's here or another time, but I don't know if that helps at all. I mean, it doesn't make anything clearer for me, but maybe we can't tell Shiva secrets or we'd all be amazing assassins. Hmm. Hmm. Literally what happens in this is it seems like she finds Shiva and it seems like Shiva's trying to kill this, this woman that has bodyguards there because like, she's been watching Shiva at this restaurant and then Shiva just, uh, you know, jumps up to fight these bodyguards and attack this woman. So Cass jumps in. Later we find out that like, Shiva's actually just been watching Cass, watching her. And so she's like, sure. The only way that she's actually going to try to fight me is if I try to kill somebody. So let me just pretend I'm trying to kill this this woman with the bodyguards here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just so that she'll get up and come after me. Yeah baffling plan is baffling she's she's playing four-dimensional chess here she is is. what did you guys think of the the cane issue where it's all through his perspective i could have done with a thousand percent less cane in this book yeah i i love the the shiva story in seven and eight and like as we get towards the end of this like run are these issues there's like three issues back to back that are like 
one-offs and tie-ins to things and i could have done without pretty much all of those i agree i for the the cane issue i did enjoy the cane issue surprisingly because i thought it was a weird decision uh but i actually enjoyed his internal dialogue more than i enjoyed Cass's because i thought it was entertaining even if it was awful as a person i was like ah he's so evil it's fun <laughs> Oh. I did love I I'm very amused by this is so sets it back in time uh but his scene where he goes to the bar still with the medicine bag attached to his arm I was <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> yeah I feel like this issue does a does a good job of like he can get and do basically whatever he wants except for the one thing that he actually wants like you know he wants to have his he wants to have his murder daughter back <laughs> And uh, she's, there's no way that she's coming with him. Yeah, you know, she it, actually runs into him at the end of the issue and like, it's not happening. I think she, that was my favorite scene. Yeah, well, she gives him the tape. So she, the whole issue is basically he's trying to get these tapes back that were taken in evidence for something, question mark. I was honestly lost as to why he was being investigated and over what, but... Um, I guess that's related to a story that happened outside of these, maybe? Do we know? I thought they were supposed to, yeah, it shows one of the ones she's looking at is actually of of Cassandra being yeah, but trained. Why did they get taken as evidence? I, I was assuming it was he got beat up by Batman. So like, oh, I guess they found him beaten up and were investigating. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why Batman, okay. I mean. So he it was wasn't in... clear is what. <laughs> Because it starts with Kane in the hospital, right? Like, right. So I guess at some point, Batman, just after torturing him for however long, was just like, let me call the cops. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess I'm leaving sense. now. So they, they take the tapes of Cass into evidence, and he, the whole thing is him trying to get them back, basically. Um, and she gives them to him at the end, because that's all he, she's leaving him of her. But I was also like, don't give creepy guy tapes of you what are right. what are you it, doing to me it felt like an act of pity um yeah. and i think it just showed how good and strong of a person she yeah. was and like i think he apologizes to her in that scene and like yeah you know i don't think it was completely sincere but it, it, to me it still worked for me and the fact that it was from his perspective was interesting and yeah. it allowed them to nail home the physicality aspect again of her, of since we're not in her head, just seeing how she's reacting. And yeah. she just says bye when he leaves. And like, yeah. it, it was just so good. That was my favorite scene in the whole book. No, I agree. I think that was strong. I like that part as well. Yeah, I, that was the only part in that issue that I was, I mean, that and the, just what a mess he is when he you know shows up at the bar with the- <laughs> right the iv stand still attached to him and everything it's really good my i think my favorite scene across these 13 issues is uh is at the end of the lady shiva story when uh shiva asked for her bracelet back and uh yes <laughs> she's she's so she's so sure that Cass is going to try something that she tells her to hand it to her with her broken hand so she can't hit her and Cass hits her anyway <laughs> with the broken arm moment. and yeah, like that was good nearly goes unconscious because she's in so much pain but she got in the last hit and that's that's that is what that so is Cass, and i love it absolutely so can we yeah. pretend the volume ends there <laughs> i feel like we have to talk about the annual it's so weird <laughs> well yeah. uh, i mean like so that's the the cane one is 11 10 is 10 feels like one of the bad episodes of batman the animated series yeah, I have exactly like, one note about it, and I don't even remember what it means. That's how much that like affected me. <laughs> it's like the guy that's been fired, but I oh, guess okay. like super strong, and goes Thank back you for to reminding his me. boss, who is maybe somehow romantically involved with, or he thinks he's romantically involved with, and it just feels like a weird morality tale. Yeah, um, I wrote down you know, it, it, issue 10, Kenny and his white male entitlement and nothing else. That's <laughs> And then he's like super invulnerable at the end for no good reason. Yeah, he was a metahuman all along and he didn't know his power. 
TJ. I guess you just get that tag <laughs> at the end where Barbara's like, so he didn't die? Huh, that's weird. And it's like, what? That was the point? Okay. I guess. <laughs> it just feels like, I don't know if you guys remember that episode of Batman the Animated Series where like he pretends to be homeless the whole episode and then at the end he goes back home and he's like, uh, Alfred's like, let me draw you a bath and then draws him a picture of a bath. <laughs> as a joke i remember and, that scene but i did not remember the homeless part of it yeah because there, there's somebody kidnapping homeless people in gotham so he pretends to be homeless and ends up in a mining camp and there's like all this stuff going on it seems like this real like weird morality play that has basically nothing to do with batman or any of the rest of the continuity of it and then it ends with this like weird offhand joke and like that's what this felt like to me of like oh okay i guess i guess i can yeah. forget about this issue i i had i had forgotten all about it i was trying to look at my notes to see if i'd missed anything and i was like who's kenny i was so confused to be fair i enjoyed the next issue even less yeah so that was the one i wanted to talk about talking about morality plays like let's get to that very special episode that was the annual well what about 12 is there too right is that whichever one is the Catwoman one is the one yeah, i'm thinking 12 of. is the one from officer down it's a tie-in to the officer down oh. event okay um, yes this is the jim gordon thing wow i really i literally read this yesterday and i don't remember these last i had two issues. i had absolutely no idea what was happening in this issue that's because it is written by chuck dixon who yeah. did not write the rest of the series does not know Cass's voice at all. Uh-uh. Um, it's everything sounds wrong and bad. Um, yeah. And there's a, a a bad guy that looks a lot like Grifter, but I don't think is Grifter. <laughs> He's the most like know. 90s ass, like mercenary with a red and black mask. Like if he had a little more a little more costume, he could just be shitty Deadpool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that that issue is bad and has no place in this series. Um, yeah, and it's drawn by Dale Eaglesham, so like it's it's not bad, but it doesn't look anything like the art style of the rest of the, no. the series. And I I did love that Catwoman has a security system that makes fun of you if you break in. That is maybe that my favorite accurate. part. Seems <laughs> accurate. She's just like you fool. <laughs> Yeah, with the last few issues, like, so I felt like the whole book, it kind of felt like the highlights of this period of her life. So, like, they were loosely connected issues, but yeah. connected enough to where it felt, it worked for me, whereas the last few issues just felt like they were so, they were just thrown in there. They weren't related. It was weird. And they were really forgettable in, in that I genuinely forgot they happened until this moment, so. Yeah, if you... If you go through this whole run, it every time there is a Batman event, uh, everything happening in the book just screeches to a halt um, yeah. so that it can tie into No Man's Land or Officer Down or you know, whatever the, the big event is now. Um, Gosh, I hate big crossovers like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the other bad than, kind of crossover. Yeah, I, I like Batman and Turtle, but other than that, big crossovers, ugh. The ones where you have to read like all the yeah. different titles to understand what's happening. I'm like, no, if I wanted to read this title, I'd be reading it. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like crossover uh, crossover issue that like is, you know, Batgirl colon officer down number one <laughs> and does not like interrupt the the flow of the rest of the book. If you read like yeah. Which I think is is maybe like a novel thing to us now reading trade paperbacks that we like see it that way. Yeah. It's this massive interruption, but like, yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I like when there is a character crossover. So someone from a different series is in this one for a little while. Like that I enjoy. But when it, the whole story crosses over, it's just so confusing. And it assumes a level of investment in every line of the run, you know, every possible run that is exhausting now was the annual the final issue in this okay i hope so because i don't remember anything else yes the, so it's, it's one through 12 plus annual number one yeah which, can and, i just say like the idea that this is uh like 
what is it like 50 issues this run of of Batgirl that's like not she's not crazy popular but like it's you know it's a b-level title in the bat family that actually gets to go for that long yeah is wild like in, yeah. in modern comics landscape um yeah you know this this would have been stopped and you know renumbered at least a few times in this <laughs> that's no. real switch you switched writers or yeah uh so the the annual is the one that I was referring to and I said it felt like a very special episode. <laughs> what? Including like actual statistics <laughs> at the end. Yeah, that ending was like very what's the word? <laughs> Bad? Not good? It was just so like it brought the mood down, man. I had a hard time reading this one. On it was just so this is again. This felt very of the time as well because I like the um you know I I swear I didn't do this on purpose, but I like the Tim Drake story that's going on current like concurrently to this, uh, and they have one of those too where he goes to a different country and has an adventure and quote teaches the reader about a different country and it's so cringy and awkward. Uh, and that's what this felt like too. Yeah, so I, I looked this up afterwards because I was like, this, this this story is about mainly Aruna, who, yes. is, uh, an, who is an Indian shape-shifting character. And I was like, surely this character came from somewhere or went somewhere that I am not familiar with. Uh, that is incorrect. This is yep, Aruna's no. one appearance. What? Um, yeah. yeah, and apparently, looking at this, each DC Comics annual for the year 2000 introduces a new international hero, superhero uh, as part of the Planet DC theme. This in- issue introduces the character of Aruna. Um, this is the only annual that was ever published for the, the Batgirl <laughs> series. And uh, yeah, this, this story, neither of the two stories in this have a title. Um, yeah. And uh, it it doesn't go anywhere like it finishes and uh this is uh, i don't think aruna yeah this is aruna's single appearance aruna never shows up anywhere ever again i really thought that the character came from somewhere else because i felt like i wasn't understanding something while reading <laughs> so nope. i am mind blown yeah there's a real this has some real heavy white savior vibes to oh, it. Oh, yeah. So I wrote down, because, uh, yeah, again, the other one that I've read around this time, which involves Batman going to Haiti, um, is the uh, same. It, oh, it reads the same. <laughs> it reads, it's it's actually worse, to be fair. It, it's even more of this. But every time during this period, and honestly, most of the time after this period, where Batman decides he's going to go superhero in a different country, it's just like colonizer vibes so hard. Well, and like making, so they made this character specifically for this issue, and then they were just like, patting themselves on the back for it but then we will never see her again (laughs) right it's like it's the comic book equivalent of the celebrities singing imagine (laughs) yeah i mean that is the best description (laughs) yeah it's somehow like that and bono at the same time like it, it just has it's just so like so the for anybody listening to this that has not read this annual the plot of this is hey do you know about untouchables in indian culture is this a thing you're familiar with have you heard about this because i just learned about this this is the writer speaking yes just learned about this i really want to tell you guys about how how unfair this is uh, how wrong this is including the very end which again was as if bruce looked straight to camera and went okay kids here's the statistics of how many people are killed this way annually and i was like what is happening you know what i i buy that for batman though it's, he he had the captain america turn his chair around video moment of <laughs> i i totally buy batman as the guy that in the middle of discussions on you know in the Justice League headquarters, Superman's like, yeah, I feel like this. And Batman's like, actually, the statistics state that over 40% of people will blah, 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 blah. Oh, and like, yeah. 
he just just breaks out a whole like sheet of statistics it's just in his head batman is a mansplainer it's <laughs> canon <laughs> batsplainer <laughs> he's a batsplainer <laughs> you're you're very right that definitely happens all the time and just like you know wonder woman rolls her eyes <laughs> <laughs> he just corrects a bit he just corrects wonder woman on stories of greek mythology sometimes and she's like do not quote me the deep magic i was there when it was written so what would you guys rate this book one out of five or one two five batarangs what would you give it for all i've you know made fun of the last few issues i i think overall we're gonna pretend the annual doesn't exist overall this is a really really good story i loved it i think it's getting four batarangs from me yeah leaving out the last couple of issues which honestly have nothing to do with the rest of the story um you know if you if you can just stop at nine and then maybe grab 11 as well um i yeah i'd, I'd say it's four batarangs and I agree. I would also give it four. The whole time I was reading, I was like, you know what? This is pretty solid. Like, it's not a favorite of mine, but it's very well done. Yeah. And then, you know, the last few issues we just won't talk about. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely like, I, I read this whole run in a chunk when I, I first bought it. Yeah. And as I was going through the first few issues, I was like, I remember liking this more than I'm liking it right now. It's It's good, but and then I got to the Shiva issues and I was like, oh yeah, that's that shit. That's that's yeah. what I like right there. When Chris told me what you had picked for your episode, I said, you know what? That's pretty on brand for him. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've wanted to write something with Cass for a long time. Yeah. But uh, between the fact that I, I haven't written much DC stuff and Cassandra, depending on the month, may not exist. Um, it's <laughs> That's true of all things, Batman, though. With the lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, so I read this. This is my second time reading this. Um, the first time I read it was right after reading Eternal, and I was trying to read solo stories for all the characters I didn't know. Because uh, that was that. <laughs> I don't know, Jeremy, if I've told you this. Batman Eternal was the first Batman book I read. <laughs> which oh, is boy. Such a wild place to jump in. I had no idea what was going on, but I loved it. Uh, so then I was like, well, I got to figure out who all these people are. And so right after Eternal and then Batman and Robin Eternal, I read this one to learn more about Cass. And it was definitely jarring. It was She's very different from the way she is written by Scott Snyder. Um, so I didn't love it as much then, I think. Going back, though, having read a lot more Cass since then, I this one worked a lot better for me now, I think. Yeah, I... I think she's a character who tends to be written sort of inconsistently outside of this book, outside of particularly Kelly Puckett's run on this book. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there's some some later fill-ins as well that feel really out of voice. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, there's there's some characters that like, just not everybody has a lock on. Like not, not every character is Peter Parker where everybody can go, oh, I know what Peter Parker sounds like or I know what Batman sounds like. Yeah. Um, this is a character with a very distinctive voice that I think uh, either either you get or you don't. Yeah, and and to be clear, like I don't think that that uh, Scott Snyder wrote her poorly. I think he wrote her well. It was just um, I don't know. It was a jarring transition between the two um, storylines. I think. Now, TJ, you have read Cass in Detective Comics. Which version do you prefer? Uh, I mean. It's so hard to compare them because she was such a minor character in that first volume that we've read of Detective Comics, but I feel like she was more grounded and believable in that in that volume, mainly because I felt like once she got uh, her internal dialogue here, it kind of pulled me out of it a little bit, yeah. uh, just I know maybe it was just the 2000s-ness of it but some of the lines she was given I was like would she really be saying that I don't know but I I, I loved this book though and I I like both portrayals of her so I yeah. am really excited to revisit Detective Comics at some point to see if they explore her more there yeah I think Cass interestingly like she has this long run as Batgirl and then she hands that off to Stephanie, but she shows up in Stephanie's Batgirl a bit. And then yeah. 
that new 52 transition is really weird because she doesn't exist anywhere but Batman Inc., which doesn't really reset. Um, and yeah. then she, after Batman Inc. runs out, she's she's basically gone until like Eternal and Detective and stuff like right. that come yeah, back she's, around. She's entered again as a new character in Eternal. So when we get around to reading that, TJ, you'll get a different version of her origin story. Okay, that's what I was thinking of earlier. Yeah, yeah. So she's at it, then, you know, her papa kane is in it but he's much scarier than he is in this version (laughs) jeremy so we have a question we ask everyone that comes on our show are you ready i'm ready okay so do you have a dream batman or bat family project that you would want to be involved with um and it could be anything uh you don't have to give us all the details if you want to keep it close to the chest but maybe themes or characters or ideas um that's a good question um i feel like there's a couple i'm i'm sort of weird in that i am much more interested in writing about characters around batman than batman himself that's Um, not weird for this podcast that's basically our whole ethos (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I like I really I really enjoy like the Gotham Central book as well because Gotham Central is such an interesting like what is it like to be a cop in a city with that there's Batman like yeah. you know the uh, the first issue of that where like they bust into a room for a, to investigate a domestic disturbance and somebody gets frozen by Mr. Freeze is wild. <laughs> um, but like I think I, I think in that same way, I really like uh, I really like Cass, obviously, and um, I like Stephanie as well. And I I feel like I'd like to write a Bat Girls book, whether it's you know Ooh. just Steph and Cass, or Steph, Cass, and Barbara, where you know we, we get to see that whole group. So I think for me, it would be either you know the three of them, or on the other side of that, you know Gotham City Sirens. Like I really like. Yeah. I really like nuanced portrayals of uh, villains. I really like Poison Ivy. I'd love to yeah. do like to do something with Poison Ivy and Catwoman and Harley and that. I think that would be great because um, yes. that's that's still like I know now she's so heavily associated with Suicide Squad, but that Gotham City Sirens version is is easily my favorite version of Harley Quinn. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I would read both of those options. Give me both. <laughs> yeah, do it yeah and of course of course if somebody walked up to me tomorrow and was like hey did you want to write like a 50 issue run of birds of prey i'd be like sure i will have that to you tonight <laughs> so. perfect and jeremy where can our listeners find you on social media and do you have any projects that are recent that you'd want them to look for or coming out soon uh so i am on Twitter at uh, jrome58. So it's J R O M E 58. I have a website, jeremywhitley.com, which I'm, I'm working on updating more, but have not been great about doing. I have a bunch of stuff I'm working on. Uh, I just had a, a graphic novel, a middle grades book called The School for Extraterrestrial Girls, come out earlier this pandemic. Uh, <laughs> came out earlier this pandemic. I've got a ongoing season 10 of of My Little Pony coming out right now, but I think probably the thing that intersects most closely right now that's going on currently is the uh, my Marvel Action Chillers miniseries, which I'm writing for IDW, uh, which is a sort of a a young reader's version of the spooky Marvel universe. So it's got a, a lot of the sort of classic Marvel horror stuff in it as well as a lot of the, you know, fun young teen characters in the Marvel Universe prominently features you know, Doctor Strange and Ironheart. Uh, it's also got my, my, my favorite, the Unstoppable Wasp, Nadia Van Dyne, and uh, a teenage version of Elsa Bloodstone, Marvel's, you know, Monster Hunter. So that series is, is going to be a lot of fun. That should be out uh, throughout, I think, November and December. It's four issues total, and that's that's a ton of fun. And I also have this podcast I'm working on. 
really well, tell us what it's about and what your amazing co-hosts are like <laughs> well my co-hosts are amazing i don't know how you knew that um <laughs> but uh yeah it's, it's a podcast that i decided to do with uh, my friends specifically at this point uh chris carey and uh, uh and our, our buddy ben um who uh sorry ben con um, has been on this podcast yes. so our, our listeners are familiar yeah, uh, where we sit down and talk about horror movies um, through a progressive lens. So we talk about things like feminism and horror and LGBT rep and horror and race and horror and sort of, you know, uh, hold hold horror movies to standards that they never actually agreed to. And so we've, we've done our first two episodes of that that should be coming out soon. They may actually be out by the time this goes up. But uh, the first two movies we watched were Jennifer's Body and Anne and the Apocalypse, both of which we loved and talked extensively about. And Anna and the Apocalypse, which I have not stopped listening to the soundtrack of since then. You're a regular soldier at war for that movie. I can't believe this is the kindest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we loved having you, and I'm sure we would love to have you again. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to come back anytime. Join us next time for The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb with our special guest. Director of Batman the Telltale series, Kent Moodle. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gotham Outsiders. You can find me, Chris, individually on Twitter at The Myth of Psyche, where I talk about queerness and feminism and pretty often Batman. You can also find me now on the new podcast, Progressively Horrified, with comics writers Jeremy Whitley and Ben Kahn. And TJ, where can they find you? They can find me at TroyFin2 on Twitter, where I talk about all things book related and occasionally Batman related. And you can find us both over on the Gotham Outsiders Twitter, at Gotham Outsiders on Twitter, where we talk about Batman all the time. Thanks for listening, and tune in next time. Same bat time, same bat place.